Can we start, Dr. Neeraj? We have two minutes. Can't hear you, Dr. Neeraj. It's taking a little longer than expected, just two minutes more. Okay. Normally, it doesn't take so much time, no? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can it from your side, the website? Sorry. Can you check from your side the website? Because from yeah. my my side, because I'm in the admin account, it is showing the same page again and again. Okay, just a it's working. We can go live. Okay, Grace, we can start. Very good evening. And warm welcome from Sanofi to all our respective speakers and all the revered medical fraternity who have joined us today. So I'm Grace Sam, working in working as medical affairs specialist for Sanofi Nutraceuticals Division. According to recent statistics, 
o osteoarthritis is the second most common rheumatological problem and the most frequent joint disease with the prevalence of up almost 40% in India. Osteoarthritis is more common in women than in men, but the prevalence increases dra dramatically with age. Osteoarthritis of the knee is a major cause of mobility impairment, particularly among females. Overall prevalence of knee OA was found to be almost 30% in India. OA was estimated to be the 10th leading cause of non-fatal burden. The topic of our today's discussion is on advancements in partial knee replacements and the role of nutraceuticals in the management of osteoarthritis. This webinar is conducted in association with IORG and OrthoTV, which is the largest orthopedic platform in India. We have with us today two of our eminent orthopedicians and orthopedic surgeons, Dr. V.C. Bose and Dr. Ronan Roy. So firstly, we can hear from Dr. V.C. Bose on the advancements in partial knee replacements for a good 20 minutes, which will be followed by an insight into the role of nutraceuticals used in osteoarthritis management by Dr. Ronan Roy. This will be followed by your Q&A uh, session. Your questions will be addressed by our respective speakers. And uh, all your questions can be uh, put on the question uh, Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. While we go through this session, please feel free to post your questions. Before we start this session, it would be my pleasure to take this time to introduce to all of you Dr. V.C. Bose. Dr. Vijay C. Bose, is an MS, DNB, uh, FRCS, and MCH in Ortho. Dr. Bose presently works as Joint Director Consultant, Joint Recru Reconstructive Surgeon at Asian Joint Recru Reconstruction Institute, located in SIMS, Chennai. And he provides a service for complex hip, knee, and shoulder problems. Doctor has a special interest in arthroplasty and has been has keen focus on hip resurfacing and partial knee replacements. He has delivered numerous guest lectures in various international conferences all over the world and performed more than 80 live surgical demonstrations in hip, knee, and shoulder replacements all over Asia. He has the experience of doing more than 2,000 hip resurfacing, which is the largest in Asia and the fifth largest in the world. He also has done extensive work in the treatment of avascular necrosis of hip and acetabular component positioning which was published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 2010. He has also developed many surgical instruments, uh, especially uh, a current one, which is a low-cost hip navigation system and a revision hip replacement stem. He was invited faculty for the annual meeting of Australian Orthopedic Association for the year 2010 and the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons in 2017. He has developed many innovative surgical techniques in the science of arthroplasty, which are used by surgeons all over the world. It's our pleasure to have you here, sir. We are gra very grateful to you for accepting our invitation and being with her here. We extend a warm welcome to you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Bo. Uh, thanks, Sam. So firstly, my thanks to Sanofi for the opportunity. Thanks to Neeraj and Ortho TV. So I will uh, uh, have my screen now. Right, okay, so we'll start there. So um, the topic given to me is partial knee replacement in 2020. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, the recent advances. So what I don't want to do is to just to give you some names of uh, new process on the market. I'd rather uh, like you to uh, like to take you through uh, the correct decision making and offering the right procedure for somebody in 2020. Uh, like also, um, we will uh, go through the surgical pathology of knee OA, which is fascinating. And a lot of people do make uh, uh, mistakes in understanding the surgical pathology of knee OA. And um, as I said earlier, the, um, uh, the focus of my talk would be to discuss the surgical options. So it's advanced. So Ronan will cover the early part, you know, early OA. And once you go to advanced OA, you need surgical options. And uh, what are the current options available? And what are the precise indications? Yeah. So it's not just about the partial knee replacement, but the entire gamut in uh, uh, the management of OA, surgical options. 
So, in, um, first you have to keep in mind that all advanced OA are not the same. That's the first thing. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, they say they are uh, TKR surgeons or they are, um, you know, uh, uni surgeons, etc. And they keep offering the same thing to everyone. That's just a no-no. And I think uh, irrespective of what you like or dislike, the patient must get what he deserves or what is best for him and not what you think uh, you are good at. I think that's, uh, that's what we have come to in, in 2020. So we have four things in advanced OA. We have subtotal cartilage loss, as you can see in that picture. We can have an antiromid loss to arthritis, or you can have a tricompartment loss to arthritis, or you can have an erosive um, arthropathy of the knee. So these uh, four are dif uh, different surgical entities, and one must treat them differently. That's the whole idea. Now, all if you have only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, so far, maybe we're all right, because uh, things were all not well developed. But in 2020, that's not acceptable anymore. So you must uh, do what is the best option for the patient and not what the only place that you know. That's very, very important. I think we have come to that stage and that's what I'm going to highlight today. So all OA of the knee is not the same. Uh, just like all back pain is not the same. You cannot put all back pain into the same basket. And if you <laughs> offer the same surgical procedure for all uh, cause of back pain, it would be a complete disaster. So you put all knee OA into the same basket and offer them the same procedure, like a knee replacement, for example, it will be a complete disaster. So early OA, uh, Ronan will talk about it. We're talking about uh, the uh, Telegram Lawrence uh, grading has been there with us for you know, 60 years. So not a very good grading, but you know, one, two, sometimes three, not a very good grading. Uh, that uh, Ronan will talk about the options, non-operative options available. But the point I want to make is uh, it must not be managed surgically. Absolutely a very important point. A lot of people do make this mistake, especially when they do a TKR on one side, and the other side they find a picture like this, they'll say, okay, I'll do the other knee also for you, and it ends up disaster. So, yeah. The take home message of the day is uh, when, you, when you find that uh, the subcondyl bone is not exposed, uh, the surgical intervention in the absence of mechanical symptoms or overload gives bad results. Each word is important in these things. So, when subcondyl bone is not exposed, and there is no mechanical symptoms, and there is no overload, if you offer them surgery, it's a disaster. A lot of people do make the mistake. Now, remember that cartilage is aneural and avascular. So with such a picture, x-ray, if somebody has pain and you offer them a total knee, for example, the source of the pain is not the knee because the cart there's still cartilage, subcondyl bone is not exposed, and it's an aneural tissue that you're dealing with, and still it's painful for some other cause. And for that, if you offer a knee replacement, you're not taking care of the primary pathology, and this is a true disaster. One second. Yeah, sorry. Um, and this is the uh, lot of literature to say, to substantiate that statement, that if we do, uh, you know, any kind of arthroplasty in a partial thickness cartilage loss or PTCL, it's going to give you bad results. So we talked about these four entities. So the, um, in 2020, this is what I think uh, you should offer, and this is what we offer uh, the patient in our unit. If you have a subtotal cartilage loss, keywords, subtotal cartilage loss with overload, then the patient is best served by, a, uh, by an osteotomy. And if you have anterior middle osteoarthritis, we'll go through all this in detail. Uh, the best served by doing a unicardial knee replacement. The patient has got a tricompartmental OA, best a TKR. The patient has got an erosive arthropathy. You have to take care of the hinge uh, or the high uh, constraint implant on day one itself. So you cannot um, sort of treat every patient with the same option. Now, symptomatic tricompartmental bone, but this is only one answer as we discussed earlier, there's a total knee replacement. There's no two ways about it. There's no talking about it. The only answer is a, a knee replacement. And there's no doubt in any mind regarding that. Now, I would like to ask you if there is isolated bone on bone petalofemoral OA, like in this patient, you find that the tibiofemoral joint is normal. He's got bone on bone petalofemoral OA, if I ask you how many people would offer a knee replacement for this, I'm sure that uh, I don't know how many people are watching. Uh, uh, some of you may say you'll do a petalofemoral arthro, uh, arthroplasty, but no one in the audience, I'm sure, would, uh, uh, would offer a knee replacement for this. Way. So um, no one would offer a TKR. And they're very apprehensive to offer a TKR for somebody who has got isolated uh, petalofemoral pain. And this pain can be quite very disabling, uh, needing surgery. However, 
if you have another kind of monocompartmental arthritis namely antremedial uh, arthritis or you know classically medial compartmental arthritis then if i ask you how many people will offer t care probably 100% will say they'll offer t care so although both these are monocompartmental arthritis for one condition we are so worried to offer and one condition we readily offer i think uh, you know it doesn't add up something is wrong somewhere so the best treatment option in the amoa uh, i would like to put forward to you approximate uh, you know the incidence 20 to 30% depending on different, different populations is an is a, a unicondylar knee replacement i'd like to put that to you now a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about a uni uh, people think it's an alternative for h2o in the young patient that's just not true it's not an alternative for the h2o in the young patient people think it is a time buying procedure before t care no it's not it's not a time buying procedure in t care and uh, a lot of people think that you must not do on older patients actually the older patient is a better candidate than the younger patient for a unicondylar knee replacement so very important uh, concept to take home and um, i i would like to state that it is a definitive intervention of choice for anterior middle oa no 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 question about that right so uh, if you do a tkr in amoa i think uh, not a great option I'll tell you why now any tkr series you publish series you take there's a dissatisfaction rate of about 20 19% 20% any series that you take i'm sure it's the same in all your hands as well so they get excellent radiographs you say you tell the patient you know you got excellent x rays but the patient keeps coming to you again and again saying that, uh, that they are not happy with that now that's because you know you have this is the um, function after uh, tkr and you can see the preoperative uh, function is very poor this is the normal function you can see that's the normal function and uh, post op you can find that the uh, that the uh, the envelope of uh, function has suddenly increased it become much better than what was pre op but it's not normal so there suddenly a satisfaction gap in tkr we got to accept that there satisfaction gap in tkr and that's why if you do a tkr on somebody with a normal function like in amoa they get point so you can see uh papers that analyze who are the patients who are going to be unhappy after tk a lot of reasons of course many reasons but the most important reason of all the reasons the most important reason if you do it early osteoarthritis kl grade 1 or 2 or 3 early uh, you do they get very poor results so if you really look at it carefully early arthritis gives very poor results at tk so if you compare the native knee to the tk uh, in with regards to alignment uh, we uh, you know the uh, most of the native knees that we see do not have a zero degree mechanical alignment but in tkr we always thought mechanical alignment was the way to go and we did and so patients were not happy then we came up with constant alignment then we came out kinematic alignment etc uh, we still don't know where to go and balance and gap suddenly the lateral side gap is much more than the middle side gap in flexion uh, but in tkr we tend to balance it we don't know whether to leave the lateral side a little more lax in flexion or not a lot of uh, you know uh, the last word has not been said about it coming to biomechanics the lateral compartment moves in a completely different way than the middle compartment whereas the tkr you know we sort of equalize everything and so people have said you know uh, you know come up with solutions like a medial pivot knee which again is okay but has not solved the problem of dissatisfaction and more recently people say that you have to retain both the cruciates when you do a tkr now that you know you know they say now that solve the problem but i can i can give it to you in writing that's not going to solve the problem so every uh, two years somebody comes and says they have solved the problem of dissatisfaction in tkr with their relation to alignment they talked about navigation robotics uh, various devices for soft shift balancing various uh, uh, so called improvements in prosthetic design but it as far as tkr technology goes we are still where we were 40 years ago there's no significant quantum leap that we have made in the last 40 years so the reason is that i think we are all barking up the wrong tree so i think the right tree is uh, when you have uh, amoa you must do uh, unicondylar knee replacement now in our unit uh, we have been doing this in large numbers last 4 5 years and we find that the dissatisfaction rate is now half what was 20% has now become 10% so i think uh, if you are able to incorporate that in your practice your dissatisfaction rate will come down by half now why so is very answer is very simple here's a knee that is kinematically constitutionally aligned But like your natural knee the ligaments have native tension and the balance is retained and you have the complex biomechanics of the lateral compartment in a completely differential movement compared to the middle compartment has been retained and you find that the native biomechanics of the patellofemoral joint also has been in so it's very much 
uh, as close to the native knee as you can possibly get, unlike a TKR. And if you find that the meal compartment from biomechanical perspective seems to be the most uh, easiest thing that you can replace because it's almost like a ball and socket joint. But the lateral compartment has got very complex biomechanics along with the cruciates, and that is almost impossible to replicate when you do a TKR. So you retain the native tissues and the most simple biomechanics you replace. That's the concept behind it, and you get excellent function post op. Now, remember, as I told you, the uh, knee has got complex anatomy and alignment, complex and variable ligament tension towards the range of movement. It's got complex biomechanics. So TKR, if you do, uh, those of you who are doing uh, TKR for AMOA, I'd like to tell you, at best, is a compromise. And I'm not, as no uh, surprise that you're getting an unsatisfaction rate of about uh, 20%. So if you start off with a very bad knee, like a very deformed knee, for example, then if you do a TKR, the patient is extremely happy, so thankful. But if the patient has got normal function pre-op, typically in the AMOA, and we do a TKR, he's not happy. You need something much more to offer the patient. And today, I think day and age, AMOA, you must offer them a, a unique or knee replacement. The next question is, uh, people always ask is, which patients, then they get bogged down. Once you say uni, they get bogged down. They say, we don't know how much FFD we can do. We don't know how much virus is acceptable. And the must the virus be fully correctable? How much of patellofemoral changes you can accept? And the lack of full flexion acceptable? Tibia vera contraindications? So people get bogged down in all the theory of it. Yeah. So today I want to give you a very simplistic perspective which you can use in your practice. And there's no need for you to get bogged down in all this. So the simplistic perspective is if you are able to establish that the ACL is functionally intact, the patient has got anteromedial osteoarthritis. If the ACL is not functionally intact, the patient does not have AMOA. He has tricompartmental OA. So very simple. There's no need to go into anything else. Just one factor you want to do. Very simplistic perspective that will work in 95% of your cases. Okay? So the intact ACL is a surrogate marker for AMOA. All that you have to establish is that the ACL is intact. If you establish that, then you are dealing with the AMOA. Forget about all the other factors. Then you can go and do a union patient. Yeah. So here's a very classical example. I want to look at this X-ray carefully. So you can see on the right side, uh, you see more advanced arthritis. And the left side, you see uh, less advanced arthritis. But both is bone on bone, OK? One of my patients. And uh, you don't know whether to do uh, a, a TKR or a uni on them. That's the petalofemoral joint, skyline view. Now, if you look at the left side knee, you can see the femur articulating with the middle of the tibia. That if it's articulated to the middle of the tibia, it means that the ACL is intact. The only thing that you need is a well-done lateral view. Once you have a well-done lateral view, it gives you. There's no need for an MRI scan. There's no need for anything else. This is the most reliable test that we have today. Good X-rays to find out whether the ACL is intact or not. Now we find that the ACL is intact. Yeah. Okay, not moved. But when you come to the right side, you can see how the femur has moved posteriorly on the tibia. That means the ACL is not functionally intact. So the, the, the femur has moved. That means the ACL. So in this patient, I have no hesitation in offering him a uni on the left side and a TKR on the right side. That's all there is to it. There's no need for doing anything else. There's no need for doing an MRI scan. There's no need for anything else. I, I, I'm done. I'm very happy. I know that the ACL is functionally in, uh, incompetent here. Therefore, he needs a TKR. So that's all there is to it. And here the ACL is intact. And therefore, he needs, he needs there is to it. So I will do a TKR on this side and a uni on this side. Now, we talked about uh, uh, the uh, AMOA being a surrogate marker. Yeah, so three features will is characteristic of, there's no posterioration, as I told you. Dental compartment is always preserved, is always correct. You don't have to look into all that. As long as the ACL is intact, this. So we can keep talking all day about gross virus, gross FFD, but these are not compatible with the AMOA. A patient with an intact ACL will not have all this. So these are all theoretical, uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense at all. You can forget about all that and have a very simplistic perspective. This is AMOA, only the anterior part is involved. Lateral cartilage is intact. Therefore, the femur is still articulating either in the anterior third or the mid third. It has not gone posteriorly. And that's the uh, important thing. So today we find that the obesity, activity level, elderly age are all not contraindications for UKI. So, so just the ACL is the only criterion that you need to look at. This is all not important. So um, uh, even if you are doing TKRs, I want you to start correlating uh, the surgical pathology with the X-ray findings. So even if you're going to do a TKR, start looking at the, and, and guess what you're going to find per op. 
I, and it's so fascinating and it'll be uh, so nice if you correlate, if you predict what's going to see um, how the ACL is going to be, how the erosion is going to be, how are going to be the lateral compartment by the X-ray, if you predict, very soon you'll be very good at predicting what you will find inside the uh, knee when you open it up. So correlating and recap will help you to build confidence. So in 2020, uh, both the osteotomy and the uni have become extremely reliable and gratifying surgeries. Now you'll ask me, uh, what is new about osteotomy and uni? They have been there for the last uh, 50, 60 years. Well, that's true, they have been there, but you know, each technology has got a, a breakthrough. Now, electric cars, for example, was you know has been there for the last 100 years. Nothing new in electric cars. People thought about electric cars 100 years ago. However, the game changer was the Tesla. Once the Tesla came, the technology changed, the battery, everything changed, and there has been a game changer. Like that, there has been game changers. The osteotomy and the uni, that now we can do it in a very predictable manner. We were doing unis and osteotomies earlier. It was like a lottery. Some people did good, some people did poor, high failure rate. But now, we had a very predictable surgery in both the osteotomy and the uni in 2020. The next question people always ask is, they are always in a confusion as to which to choose. So I'll give you this algorithm. And people always think it is very difficult, like choosing between iPhone and Android, but it's not actually. It's easy very to choose. So if you see this uh, thing, so you know, when a patient has got subtotal cartilage loss, uni is better. In an younger patient, uni is better. Uh, sorry, osteotomy is better. Higher activity level, osteotomy is better. Significant extracular component, osteotomy is better. Uh, activity related discomfort, there's no night pain. Only on activity the patient gets pain, uh, he's a candidate for, a, for an osteotomy. And a short fat patient is a contraindication. So it's a spectrum. So once you identify patients on one, both ends of the spectrum, it's a rare patient. 10% of the patient you'll find in, in the center area. So each, all patients or most patients will go into either end and it's very easy to make a treatment choice. In contrast to that, uh, when for a uni, a bone-on-bone -bone changes is a uni. A older patient is a uni. Bone-on-bone, -bone, very established arthritis with significant erosion is a uni. Lesser activity relation, usually female patient is a uni. None or little, little malalignment. There's no extracular virus. It's focal pain and night pain. Patient has got night pain. That means, you know, it's not a mechanical pain. So uh, it's not an overload pain. And the short fat patient is not a contraindication for a uni. Another, another three points I wanted to tell you, in those patients who are sitting in the middle, if you have AP instability is a problem, uh, you can address with both, with a uni as well as thing, but it's more readily addressed with a H2O. A lack of full flexion is a problem in both, but more easily accommodated in H2O. Subluxation is, is a problem in both. They are free of subluxation, but it's more readily compensated in a H2O. And only a very, very mild subluxation can be taken care of while doing a uni. So in these three factors, the osteotomy scores over the uni. So the most important thing that you must have when you start doing osteoarthritis is not some fancy investigation, but properly done x-rays. Now, uh, whenever any patient comes to see me, then they, you know, just order x-rays or a scanogram outside, I'm yet to see a well-done X-ray in Chennai that is not done in our unit. Because in our unit, we have to go to the radiographer and keep telling them that they have to do this way, this way, this way. And that's how they become, radiographers become very good at it. If you just send a patient for X-ray, they're going to get very crappy X-rays and that's not going to help you make a management. So that's how a standing AP, one leg standing must look. Uh, and then uh, a scanogram, for example, this scanogram is completely, you cannot make any decision with scanogram. The petla is not facing anteriorly and you'll make wrong decisions with this. So this is a scanogram repaired in our unit. You can see the petla in the dead center, and you can start making decisions based on this scanogram. So the X-ray, proper and X-rays are the most important tool that you have in the management, the surgical management of osteoarthritis. So MRI, uh, we use occasionally when you want to see overload symptoms. That's a typical overload symptom, which you can take, you can deload with an osteotomy. And uh, sometimes you see men meniscus extrusion, and lateral cartilage, very occasionally that you want to visualize the lateral Only when the patient has got lateral side pain, I will do an MRI. Otherwise, I will not do an MRI. It confuses the issues. So I, just good x-rays is what I need. Now, recently, I've been using SPECT. And you can see in this patient with the early osteoarthritis, there's a middle overload symptoms. And he may be a very good candidate for H2O. And this patient, although similar looking x-rays, you can see that the, there's not a middle overload. And if you do an osteotomy on this patient, you may be, we, we, we still have a sort of uh, a very comfortable respect, but that's something that we're looking at. Now, in 2020, as I told you, the game changer with osteotomies has been two things. 
one is our understanding the biomechanics we now understand so we used to do ashtamis right from 2000 i've done uh, lots of ashtamis those days used to be lotty some will do well some will do very badly but today we have a very reliable technique and uh, this is the only way of doing for all the youngsters who are listening is the only way of doing ashtamis today in 2020 you must not be doing um, unless you know 5% of ashtamis for some other reason you need to have a rotation correction etc you may think of for uh, complex ashtamis but for 95% of the patients you must do only this ashtami the blanket statement to make you must do a biplanar opening wedge ashtami on the tibia and uh, and a biplanar closing wedge ashtami on the on the femur for varus arthrosis of the knee you must not be doing any other ashtami because these are the only ashtami that so reliable and in every patient you can get a very good result and you must use a locking plate in 2020 nothing else to be used so what is our correction target has changed earlier on we used to uh, talk about the fujisawa point where we want to bring it to about 62.5 percentage that i'm sure you all aware of on the lateral side but we find that that is just too much and now we aim for only 55 to 60 percent so we just want to be on the lateral tibial spine we don't want to go all the way laterally earlier we found that patients were unhappy because that knees were rubbing inside and they found uh, you know the uh, once they, they were in varus for a long many years and suddenly they become valgus and the knees stop rubbing each other and they felt that limb was longer and patients were not happy at all but uh, now we know that all that is not required all that you have to do is deload this compartment you don't have to take them into serious valgus so now we aim for 55 to 60% i'll tell you how to do it and there's a classical one in the uh, in our unit where you can see that the uh, mikulux line is going through the lateral tibial spine that's what you want to aim today and you, and you get such gratifying results with a properly done osteotomy today um okay so uh, another rule of thumb that we have if you are greater than 10 degrees it needs a bone graft but that's very very rare uh, for it have to create it in 10 degrees uh, usually you can use a synthetic substitute if you want if it is more than 15 degrees that you are aiming for correction you are doing the wrong procedure simple as that you are doing the wrong procedure here you must do something else your calculation is wrong so uh, calculating the angle of correction quickly i will take you through it very simple uh, you first draw the mikulux line uh, that will be the uh, you can see it where the purple one and then you draw another line from the center of the hip from the, the lateral tibial spine where it meets the lower line which is perpendicular to the mikulux line and then you draw a third line where you are going to do the osteotomy the apex of the osteotomy which are the lateral border of the tibia at the level level of the apex of the fibular head and then you draw another line joining these two points so that is your angle of correction which you project uh, immediately to find what should be your angle of correction and thereby you work out the degree so very straight forward calculation to do and that's what you must do in all the patients now uh, another common mistake that people will make is uh, they don't find where the source of the deformity so remember the deformity could be in the femur could be in the tibia or it could be in the joint or a combination of both and that's the commonest mistake that people make with regards to the so keep these values in mind you know, the lateral distal femoral angle normal is 85 to 90 the mpta the proximal tibial angle is also 95 to 100 the lateral convergence angle which is this angle the convergence angle uh, that's that is how the joint line opening when there's a ligamentous component to the deformity it must be 2 uh, degrees or less and that's all that you need to remember everything falls into place so here is a patient with a uh, totally got patient has got 17 degree varus now this is the mistake that you must not do and if you calculate the mpta is 82 degrees now if we didn't know that and if we just went and did a high tibial osteotomy but uh, the ldfa is 97 degrees so um, if you do uh, a, a single level osteotomy here you will end up with the mpta of 99 degrees this is what we used to do earlier the problem with this is you'll end up with a oblique joint line and this is the it will create great shear forces and the, the the pressure will fail very rapidly so the correct way of doing it would be uh, you have to address both because both are wrong mpta is also wrong ldfa is wrong you must address both and once you address both you'll get a a joint line that is parallel to the ground so very simple calculations do but you must not escape the calculations you must do the calculation of patients Here's a most uh, recent patient we did a couple of weeks ago. What did uh, female patient middle uh, knee pain referred to conservative measures? Had scopy and a two-stage ACA procedure. The pain got aggravated after the ACA procedure, and that's a 
okay well done scanogram you can see that now you think okay i'll do hto now you can see that uh, the the mpd angle is not bad 88 it is actually although there is some virus on the tibia there is more uh, virus on the femur than the tibia that you got to work out with your angle with a well done scanogram and therefore now we do the reverse now so uh, you can do a double level osteotomy here but it be too much to do for this uh, low level of deformity so we chose to do only a distal femoral osteotomy now the lines have been reversed so from the uh, midpoint of the ankle we draw a line to the lateral tibial spine it goes there then we draw another line from here this will be an apex of deformity correction at the supracondylar region and then we work out the angle there is a 12 degree wedge that correspond to 10 mm uh, wedge that you need to take 12 degree will correspond to 10 mm wedge here and that's what we have done we have not done a hto at all if you done a hto on this patient you will end up with a very oblique joint line and that is the reason why most of the things failed earlier now we know how to recognize it and how to deal with it now we go on to the uni now one must remember in the uni that uh, you must forget all your principles of the tkr we are not aiming for mechanical alignment we just you can see how we are not aiming for mechanical alignment we just want to match the tibia to the femur and retain all the native alignment etc so the uni has been there for the last uh, 40 50 years but what has been the game changer has been as we got the mobile bearing uh, unit has been the microplasty instruments once we have the microplasty instrument well, the mcl as our use as a, as a guide uh, to align the knee so everything falls into place with the mobile bearing knee now uh, the fixed bearing knee is a little more difficult because we cannot use uh, we are not doing it in the and like question and we cannot use the mcl as to align it so it is a little more uh, difficult so the uh, fixed bearing uni more prone for problems alignment is a problem because we cannot align use the mcl for alignment various angulation will be taken care of in the mobile it not be taken care of in the, uh, in the again the posterior slope is a problem in a fixed bearing unit so what has been the game changer for a, a fixed bearing uni it has been a robotics now uh, when you start using robotics for uni the same principles of osteotomy you are applying here exactly the same principles of osteotomy not a tkr principles but osteotomy principles we are now applying to a uni so we do a valgus stress in real time so if you see that that's the valgus stress x ray so what is the alignment that you get with valgus stress is going to be the alignment that you aim for post uni post fixed bearing uni and the only way you find it out is with a robot so once you found out what this uh, Uh, post op alignment we're not aiming for mechanical alignment is the valgus stress what the alignment they are getting that's what i'm going to aim for once you know that you know, and everything falls into place you can see that uh, note that we are not getting into valgus we are not going into the lateral tibial spine it's more like the tibial middle spine because we are not uh, translating the osteotomy principles but we are doing it like an osteot so we want to leave it a little bit of residual varus the varus that it corrects fully that's what we want to leave it at So usually in about one or two degrees of varus, I can see it in that. And to do this, you need a robot to do that. There are some additional advantages of robotics. They're not very important. That's really the key advantage. You can have precise gap plan planning, or you can have you know the placement can be more uh, refined with a robot than with manual instrument. But these are minor advantages. The real advantage is because you don't have the MCL, you're using like a HTO robot to align the knee where you want to uh, sit. now you can see all this i can you can see residual varus in all the patients we are aiming for residual varus but the varus that is fully correctable the valgus stress that's what we are aiming for and if you see the uh, thing all this is the uh, you know planned varus that we planned and with the robot we are very close we are only off by one or two degrees max so that's the uh, uh, been a game changer for fixed bearing uni has been the robot so that's the uh, correct indications for doing the various procedures for advanced oa today in 2020 so on behalf of my team I'd like to thank you for that thank you thank you uh, thank you dr bose for that in very insightful uh, practical and difficult approach uh, to partial knee replacement uh, to uh, thanks for sharing that to our uh, to our orthopedic and surgeons from your vast experience thank you so much Uh, so next we will uh, uh, move on uh, uh, Dr. Ronan Roy. So I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ronan Roy to all of you. 
So Dr. Ranan Roy uh, is uh, presently working as the director of uh, Bone and Joint. Uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's working at uh, Fortis Hospital, uh, Kolkata. So doctor has an MBBS from uh, Calcutta Medical College and FRCS from Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons at Glasgow. So Dr. Ranan Roy is one of uh, the best orthopedic surgeons uh, with a vast experience of more than 15 years. Uh, he's currently attached to, uh, as said, Fortis Hospital, Kolkata. So he's an orthopedic surgeon of international repute and is an expert in all forms of orthopedic surgery with a special, uh, special flair for joint replacement surgery, management of complex trauma, and diagnosis and treatment and management of osteoporosis. His main area of uh, specialization includes uh, fracture treatment, including minimal invasive surgery, spine surgery, trauma surgery, and arthroplasty, arthroscopy, ACL, reconstruction, meniscus injury, polytrauma, pelvic and acetabular surgery, and sports injuries and fractures and also joint replacement surgery. So in the course of his illustrious international career, Dr. Ron Roy has also served as a full-time lecturer in orthopedics and trauma at the University of Bates Cardiff. He's also a member of the faculty for many basic, intermediate, and advanced courses in joint replacement surgery. Doctor is also associated with IOA, uh, West Bengal Orthopedic Association, and IAS, that is Indian Arthro Arthroplasty Society. So we are very grateful, sir, for accepting an invitation and being with us today. Uh, over, to, over to you, Dr. Ranjoy. Thank you, Grace. Right. Uh, well, as uh, Vijay said, that I'll be dealing more with the earlier cases of osteoarthritis. And uh, as Grace mentioned in her uh, early introduction that we have almost 30% of Indians being affected by osteoarthritis, which basically gives us a number of almost 30 to 40 million people having osteoarthritis in this country. And you can appreciate that it's impossible to offer surgery to most of them. Not only can do they not need it, but a lot of them are not in a position to actually be approached. So our penetration of replacement surgery is actually very poor. If you leave the uh, tier one and tier two towns, I think the penetration is less than 1%. So automatically, the load comes on the nutraceuticals and we have to think of how it can actually help us in management of this extensive medical condition. So the term nutraceuticals was actually coined from the word, combination of the words nutrition and pharmaceutical. And they've been shown to have a beneficial effect in osteoarthritis as they have a limited effect on the biological target. The time window is significantly longer in osteoarthritis because you have a much more chronic disease and they provide a safer alternative as their use is generally devoid of adverse effects. So nutraceuticals given in the right dose have a nutritional and physiological effect. One of the longest used nutraceuticals actually has been glucosamine. It's actually been introduced in the 1970s and initially was used in veterinary medicine. And it was then subsequently used in um, humans. And uh, glucosamine has seen its ups and downs, but it's probably now the most established uh, nutraceutical, so to speak, as far as management of osteoarthritis is concerned. And uh, clinically, it's been shown to improve elasticity, strength, and the resilience of cartilage. And the suggested dosage is about 1,500 milligrams a day. We know that it helps in the stimulation in the production of cartilage and also allows rebuilding of cartilage. And the mucopolysaccharide and collagen synthesis in the fibroblast tissue is also increased. And furthermore, the synthesis of uh, the core protein of cartilage in human chondrocytes also seems to be increased. As a result of this, in mild to moderate arthritis, it's been shown to have symptomatic relief and also help in the structural repair and tissue regeneration and safety. This is actually the slide that I'd like most of you to uh, actually pay attention to. In fact, these are the three pivotal studies that were done and published in three major journals, the Lancet in 2001, the Archives of the Internal Medicine in 2002, and the Arth Arthritis and Rheumatology Journal in 2007. And as you can see here, in all the, these journals, you can see that 
this patented crystalline glucosamine sulfate actually favored glucosamine. So whether it was the Womack pain score, the Womack functional score, or the Lekesny index, all of them showed that crystalline glucosamine sulfate actually was very beneficial in early to moderate arthritis. Another interesting study was published in 2008 where 275 patients who had earlier been followed, treated for um, arthritis with glucosamine sulfate were followed up five years after the end of the study. And out of these, 133 had been on placebo and 144 of them were on glucosamine. And the interesting thing is that knee replacements have happened in double the number of patients who were on the placebo, that's about 14.5%, as compared to those receiving glucosamine who were only about 6.3%. So the relative risk was actually a 57% decrease compared with placebo. So total joint replacement can be drastically delayed or reduced if glucosamine sulfate is used at an appropriate early stage. Now let's come to chondroitin. Chondroitin again has been shown to absorb water, improve the elasticity of cartilage, and thereby help in absorbing and distributing compressive forces on the joint. It also stimulates chondrocyte metabolism and production of collagen and proteoglycans. It also inhibits degradative enzymes like elastase and hyaluronidase. And it also has a significant anti-inflammatory action by reducing interleukins, reducing phagocytosis, and also reducing the release of lysozyme and lysozyme-induced damage. So what's the clinical evidence as far as the combination of glucosamine and chondroitin is, is concerned? I'd like to bring your attention to, again, a recent study that was published in 2015, a meta-analysis of 54 studies which covered over 16,000 patients, where they combined, where they compared five different types of treatment, glucosamine alone, chondroitin alone, the combination of the two, and combination with or without celecoxib. And these showed that all treatment options showed significant improvement from baseline. Only glucosamine plus chondroitin showed significant improvement in, in uh, base, from baseline function. And Significant reduction in joint space narrowing was shown only in the combination of glucosamine alone or chondroitin alone. And the study provided evidence to show that the it was symptomatically effective to use both glucosamine and chondroitin in combination. So all these uh, methods of treatment have been now established. So seeing the efficacy of glucosamine, there's been a renewed interest over the last 25, 30 years on seeing if more nutraceuticals could actually be introduced to try and manage this problem. And as a result of it, a large number of molecules have evinced interest. So among them, you've got undenatured collagen type 2, curcumin, flavonoids, methionine, fish oils, hyaluronic acid, pomegranate extract, cat's chloin extract, ginger, boswellia serrata, pineapple, and even green tea. And I won't look at all of these in detail, but I'll try and look at some three of the more common compounds in slightly more detail. The first one that I'll be looking at is undenatured type 2 collagen. And this was actually uh, first patented by the company Lonza. And it's been shown that it's a naturally occurring type 2 collagen. And this is actually derived from chicken sternum, which is the best source of this type of collagen and it's generally regarded as safe. It's been shown to improve joint health, and it's registered in the FDA. And this type of patented uh, undegenerate, uh, undenatured collagen has a significant benefit over generic type two collagen because it's a patented manufacturing technique. It shows that the original structure is maintained, and it's also been shown to have better oral tolerance. Now, the question that arises is that how does undenatured collagen work? Because in the intact collagen cannot be directly absorbed by the body. In fact, it would be rational if supplements to rebuild cartilage were used without arresting the ongoing inflammation. And it actually works by a process where it desensitizes 
uh, the pair's patches through a mechanism called oral tolerance. So let's look at what oral tolerance actually means. Oral tolerance basically happens when the undenatured collagen enters the pair's patches. It actually helps the T cells to recognize the antigen epitopes, as a result of which the immune response against the, uh, the cartilage collagen type 2 is suppressed. Again, there's an in increase in uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines, and as a result of which there's suppression of cartilage collagen degrading enzymes. So thus, as a result of this, the cartilage degeneration is suppressed. So you can see that by roundabout way, the oral collagen actually works through this mechanism of oral tolerance. And there's clinical ev evidence to actually uh, support this theory. In fact, to try and support this, 190 volunteers were randomized into three groups. And uh, it was shown that there was a significant reduction in oral Womack, overall WOMAC scores compared to placebo and uh, glucosamine chondroitin when uh, undenatured collagen type 2 was given. And it also improved knee function joint symptoms in neoe subjects and was well tolerated. And you can see on the chart on the left, placebo is the top line in blue. The orange line is uh, glucosamine chondroitin, which performed better than placebo, but even better than that was done denatured collagen. Similarly, you can see on the right-hand side, the same sort of pattern with uh, the visual analog uh, pain scores. And you can see again that undenatured collagen actually fared the best. In another study, again, which was designed to check the effectiveness of uh, collagen peptides. 30 patients over the, between the age of 30 and 60, 65 were given uh, either undegenerated collagen or placebo. And uh, the results showed that there was a significant reduction in the WOMAX scores, the FAST scores, as well as uh, uh, it, when you compare collagen peptides with placebo. And again, it showed an improvement in the overall physical problems associated with osteoarthritis. So it's been proven that undegenerated collagen improves knee joint symptoms in knee OA subjects and is well tolerated. In fact, you can see in this slide that in, if compared to placebo, you, you should have seen an increase of eight, plus eight degrees in extension of the knee. So basically, the, there was symptomatic improvement in the range of movement. There was also greater increase in the duration of exercise. So, for example, if a patient initially had exercise pain after one and a half hours, he could almost double his exercise regime after treatment with undegenerated collagen. And in fact, it's been shown to have a 33% reduction in WOMAX scores, a 40% reduction in VAS scores and a 20% reduction in the uh, uh, Lekesny's functional index scores. That is a reduction in the severity of OA. The third uh, substance that I'd like to look at is mobili and uh, what it, uh, how it compares with hyaluronic acid. Now, what exactly is mobili? Mobili is actually a, a compound that has a unique composition of three major components. It has a high concentration of hyaluronic acid, which constitutes between 60 to 75%, polysaccharides in the region of 10% or more, and collagen in the region of, again, 5% or more. And it has been shown that unlike hyaluronic acid, mobili actually has an effect of increasing endogenous hyaluronic acid synthesis by almost 1.8 times. So it's far more effective than uh, generic hyaluronic acid as far as the functional efficacy of uh, the hyaluronic acid is concerned. And mobile is actually, again, approved by the FDA, is regarded as safe, helps in maintaining joint health and mus muscular function, and it's been scientifically tested in over 10 clinical trials, and it's a uh, patented product of Bioverica in Spain. And then, in fact, in this particular Graph on graphic on the left, you can see that it actually improved the power of the joint. And you can see in, in over here a significant improvement in the power. And similarly, 
the strength of the joint as well was improved, as you could see by the increase in the peak torque that the extensors could actually withstand after treatment with uh, mobility. And there's, unlike Gen, it's also been shown that there is a significant difference between mobility and the generic hyaluronic acid. So unlike generic hyaluronic acid, the patented mobility with its unique three component structure is extracted from the richest known source of hyaluronic acid, which is the rooster combs or, or the cox combs, and is supported by enough uh, research evidence and has actually been shown to have increased efficacy compared to generic hyaluronic acid. Finally, the, the third component that I'd like to look at is curcumin or natural curcumin or curcumin domestica. And basically, this works as a significant anti-inflammatory act, uh, action by acting on both the LOX and the COX pathways. And it, you can see in both uh, the LOX and the COX pathways, it acts on the last step where it uh, acts on the, the conversion of LOX and COX to the uh, uh, inflammatory mediators. So curcumin has been shown to be beneficial in osteoarthritis by reducing joint pain, reducing joint swelling, reducing joint stiffness, and improving joint function overall. There was a study done and a head-to-head -head comparison with ibuprofen. In fact, a patient, 170 patients, 50 years, around 50 years of age, with primary osteoarthritis were randomly uh, assigned to receive ibuprofen 800 milligrams a day or curcumin domestica extracts of two grams a day for six weeks. Both groups were shown to have improvements in all assess assessments, but the curcumin group was actually seen to be statistically better as far as patient satisfaction, time walk, stair climbing, and pain during uh, walking or stair climbing was concerned. And you can see that compared to ibuprofen on the left, you can see that the pain control was better. And also on walking, it was seen to be better than ibuprofen. So curcumin extracts seem to be as efficacious and are probably as safe as ibuprofen for the treatment of osteoarthritis. Now, Sanofi's come up with this power pack formulation to try and tackle tonic pain and improve joint health in osteoarthritis by combining these three products. So it's the first powerful combination in India, consists of two patented ingredients, that's uh, undenatured collagen type two from its makers, Lonza, and Mobili from Biobedica. And the right dose combination actually makes sure that you get the maximum of effectiveness of all three of the components of this particular uh, nutraceutical. And you can see that they have complementing uh, effects. Undenatured collagen gives an anti-catabolic effect and uh, is, acts as a chondroprotective. Hyaluronic acid enhances lubrication and curcumin gives an anti-inflammatory and analgesic action. As a result of which, you get reduced joint discomfort, you promote the joint uh, and cartilage health and you improve joint flexibility. As a result of which, you get a healthier and more active lifestyle. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron Roy, uh, for that very insightful session. Yes. Uh, Dr. Neeraj? Okay, so I think we'll uh, move on to the question and answer session. Uh, so we have uh, a question here from one of our uh, viewers. Uh, so do you consider posterior tibial slope to decide between HPO and partial knee? So I think, uh, uh, Dr. Bose, you can take that up. Yeah. So uh, we don't uh, look at the posterior slope as a factor to decide whether you go osteotomy or a uni. However, uh, if there is a slope problem, it's better... Uh, as I said, mentioned in my lecture, connected with the osteotomy than with the with the uni. So it's, it's uh, slope slope. Uh, you know, if there's a slope issue, 
better to do a better to do an osteotomy than a uni so that's it. but we don't look at the slope a slope as a as a factor to decide which way to go i mean as uh, shown in his slide slides that uh, it's important to assess the acl i mean at the end of the day integrity of the acl and the, and the uh, position of the femoral condyle on the tibia is probably the most important determ clinical determinant as to whether you're going to go ahead with the uni or not okay so i have few questions from ortho tv uh, yeah neeraj yeah okay so uh, for dr bose one uh, is the lateral x ray which you take before planning a tkr or uni is it in standing or you take it in a specific amount of flexion well uh, the uh, it doesn't matter really but the, uh, we we take a little bit of flexion it's only about uh, you know 15 20 degrees but the key thing is both the condyles must be superimposed on each other okay. that is the uh, key thing and once you see that you will see uh, so in a in a patient with the acl intact no matter what the flexion is you won't have that the bear riding uh, the femur riding all the way back okay and uh, dr pramod nirwane he is also from ortho tv he is asking whether how easy it is to revise a uni to a tkr or do you have, have you ever revised a uni to another uni i don't have experience of uh, revising one unit to another uni but okay. uh, these days uh, these are all cardinal principles you know earlier on you know when we used to revise a uni uh, badly done uni Uh, i do see a real problem most likely we needed uh, an augment or a metaphyseal sleeve and that's a big no no i mean that's really what you should not be doing but uh, now we know that uh, we we do it very conservative tibial dissection that's one of the fundamental grounding principles of a uni today and mm -hmm. we always compare uh, i am very fond of saying this you know the tibia uh, medial slice that we have in a tkr and the uni uh, both must be the same we must not do dissect more in a uni by doing that then you must stop doing unis it's really uh, very because you, you know your further revision becomes very difficult so when you do a very conservative uni it's really a joy to revise it just take it off and and do a primary tkr and if everything is done well in the primary uni uh, the uh, tkr should give as good results as any other primary tkr and now one point i want to make regarding the earlier question uh, just a second so the Uh, i think the uh, the person who asked the question wanted to know whether in flexion only it goes back it doesn't do like that it's permanently subluxed so whether you do it in extension or flexion doesn't matter the the femur is permanently subluxed okay and about the uh, sorry about the uh, the you said that it's just in a newer generation unis or this robot so what does exactly the robot do the robot cuts for you does the work like for a urologist or you still have to guide the robot what does the robot exactly do no no we have to do everything so only a tool that mm. we hold in our hands so the basically okay. uh, you know whatever we set on the computer it allow us so it like a probe the probe will allow you to burn it off and if you go wrong the probe will stop so it allow you only what you're planning so we are uh, translating what we planned to the thing but more importantly than what than that as i told you we don't know what to aim for with all these angles you know in a in a in a, in a mobile bearing we use the mcl to guess so that become we don't need a robot for that but if you want to fix the bearing you need you don't know what you're aiming for you're not aiming for mechanical axis uh, you know you, you just don't know what what is your aim point but with a robot we know what our aim point is so we know exactly what we're doing so there's in the femur or the tibia wherever like just like a hto or a you know distal femur last year we know where the deformity is and we want to vary this to be our final axis what do we want we want 1 degree varus 2 degree varus whatever we want based on the valgus stress uh, readings that we get and then we aim for that that's the most important part of the robot when you use uni and that's why i feel a robot doesn't make much difference in a tkr tkr you know using a robot you know no big deal but a uni fixed bearing is invaluable yeah okay and uh, uh, grace did you did you ask this question did you consider posterior tibial slope to decide between sto and partial knee yes sir, that was the first question acha that was already answered na yeah. yeah okay so the next question is for dr ronin roy in the situation where nowadays elective surgery is a bit difficult uh, what is your suggestion and basically from my side what are the indications like 
in what cases will you give a nutraceutical like a collagen or will you try to inject a prp or a steroid or hyaluronic acid in a, in a knee how do you decide but early to moderate arthritis i think i i definitely go uh, try with a nutraceutical first and uh, uh, try and see how the patient is doing by and large i'm not very keen on steroids to be very honest uh, i find that uh, it's actually been shown even though they give good transient relief they actually uh, probably hasten the degenerate rate of degeneration in a lot of patients so personally i am uh, not very keen on using steroids unless there is an oa flare in which case uh, it can give some symptomatic relief if i have to give an intraarticular injection it's usually uh, a hyaluronic acid or a, a prp and uh, i i usually find that hyaluronic acid somehow seems to be giving much more predictable results in my hands compared to prp uh, so i now they seem to go back to the uh, hyaluronic acid injections as opposed to prp but obviously uh, if the patient is reached a stage where they require uh, surgery then we have to decide on what type of surgery that they require and i think uh, vijay actually showed the four different stages of uh, surgical intervention in arthritis and i think that slide was probably the most uh, educative slide for any young surgeon to try and see uh, when you're going to do an osteotomy when you're going to do a uni when you want to do a total knee and when you might actually require a constrained total knee so i think uh, uh, it, it's it's an osteoarthritis is a complete spectrum of disease so so initially uh, early uh, anteromedial oa you can probably get away with new pharmaceuticals uh then you can move on to prp and uh, hyaluronic acid as a, a adjunct and then uh, obviously then you move take the next step forward but uh, as uh, in the these covid times i think we are depending more and more on nutraceuticals and uh, uh temporary prop ups so that we can actually uh, get a bit more confident with increasing our numbers rather than uh, exposing patients to the worries of having surgery right now in the middle of uh, these difficult times so is this the new normal do you think that this is going to be the new normal for the next 3 to 6 months uh, this question is to both of you so dr ron and roy can answer first and then i'll take well, i mean I, i think that uh, it, it actually depends uh, on the person the place that you're operating on first uh, as well as the comfort level of the surgeon and the comfort level of the patient so i think it's a, it's it it cannot be a one rule for everybody and uh, the surgeon needs to be feel confident that he can provide uh, safe surgery for his entire team as well as for the patient and the patient should also feel comfortable uh, in the environment that he or she is going to have the surgery in and also be uh, having adequate backup at home so that uh, in the convalescence phase they can actually be treated But where the problems are on the rise, and uh, you know, I mean, areas are going into lockdowns and things like that, it's a very dicey situation to try and operate right now. So I think uh, very few of us are. I mean, we tried opening up in between, but then a lot of us have actually had to come down a gear or two and just go back to doing uh, emergency surgeries. What about you, Doctor Bose? What is your point on this? Yeah. How many months do you think you can go on like this? well it's going to be a long haul that's for sure so even if you are able to sort of flatten the curve and all that we still going to be a long haul so we must get ready we doing a bit of elective surgery and all that so uh, we need to get used to the protocols and stuff so we are doing elective surgery but it's going to be it's not going to go away overnight or in a month or a couple of months so i think back to our pre covid days it'll take a minimum a year i think for sure yeah yes So we have uh, Ronan, some more questions. I, from, uh, sorry. Ron, can yeah, I go can on, sir. Yeah. Uh, Ronan, yes. the uh, in Colaplex Pro, uh, which uh, type of uh, patient would be the ideal patient? Having patellofemoral pain or pain on weight bearing or what? Are, what is your uh, thoughts on it? Well, uh, basically, honestly, patellofemoral pain results seem to be pretty good actually. In fact, you know the old patients who used to come for chondromalacia patellae. i mean if you treat them a lot of them actually have an osteomalacia component so if you give them calcium vitamin d and then you add a something like a colaflex pro plus with that that definitely does help significantly in these in these patients 
So I think that uh, 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 young patients and in early arthritis, results are excellent. Okay, so I have some more questions which have just come. Uh, so this is for Dr. Ronan Roy. Glucosamine and chondroitin has not been recommended by Osteoarthritis Research Society, International and even NICE. But what's your clinical experience? Well, I mean, I'm sort of uh, in the generation that's grown up with glucosamine and chondroitin. And uh, uh, in the 90, 80s and 90s, uh, it was probably the only uh, nutraceutical that was available. And uh, Honestly speaking, I think that it does give significant relief in early arthritis, uh, but it needs to be continued for a significant length of time. And uh, not every patient uh, requires surgery or is willing to have surgery. So I think it definitely helps in buying time. And uh, I, I haven't been disappointed despite using it for, well, almost 30 odd years now. So how long do you think the nutraceuticals need to be continued? And well, as long as the patient uh, wants to continue with them, I have no issues. I mean, I've had patients taking them for 10 years even. And uh, so according to you, what is the best standalone or combination of molecules that have been recommended for joint stiffness or extension issues? Means I think he's meaning flexion deformity. I don't well, think anything works in flexion deformity, according to my opinion. You can't really. I mean, uh, it... it undenatured collagen is supposed to have some improvement in extension uh, because it, it actually is supposed to help in uh, tendon issues and muscle problems and studies have shown that it's supposed to improve it but honestly speaking I think physiotherapy and exercises and a short course of anti-inflammatories probably works as well if you combine it with a nutraceutical so I mean uh, the nutraceuticals tend to continue over a more prolonged period of time and if you intersperse it with uh, short bursts of physiotherapy in between, that probably buys a lot of time and helps in delaying surgery. Do you have any uh, experience in stem cells? Honestly speaking, stem cell surgery is, uh, stem cell implantation is basically more for localized and punched out lesions. And pickup rate for such uh, lesions is very low in our country. So honestly speaking, I can't put my hand under my heart and say that I'm very confident with the results of stem cells. I don't know about Vijay. Yeah, um, the, certainly uh, I subscribe to that view. But the uh, more important point is, you know, uh, surgeons, uh, they find, you know, pain and all that. Then they just give some stem cell therapy or uh, there's a case that I showed, you know, with an ACI, two stage, two times anesthetic and all that. Now, the first thing you have to uh, rule out is a malalignment. Fundamental concept which is missed out there. So if the pain has got a mal alignment, you can put whatever you want on it. It's not going to work. So unless you're going to correct the mal alignment. So in the presence of mal alignment, uh, overload pain, there's just no point in doing whatever. Even if you have natural cartilage and you put it, it's not going to work. There's an overload there. So that's the commonest mistake people make. They don't recognize the overload and they do something um, fancy procedure. And that's just not going to work. So all this should be applied, if at all, the absence of malalignment and overload. It will not work. Simple as that. Very true. I couldn't agree more. And the other thing that we must realize is that if there isn't significant malalignment, in our country, a lot, lot of time, osteoarthritic pain has a component of osteomalacic pain. So it's important to uh, avoid, uh, make sure that uh, there's no calcium vitamin D deficiency in these patients. So along with nutraceuticals in early arthritis, if you don't have significant malalignment, then uh, probably a course of vitamin D calcium would also be beneficial. Uh, absolutely, yeah. There's um, the, you know bone uh, in our bone metabolism is really bad in our especially in our female patients, and we are not uh, averse to even use agents like teriparatide, for example. You know, when they have and we think there is an overload pain. The patient and we think it's more uh, distal than you would think. Then you know they are having some kind of a um, you know subclinical fracture going on, and we would use teriparatide in that situation. Absolutely. Uh, in this uh, now, as we are talking about conservative management of osteoarthritis, I would like to ask you or both of you that what is the role of brace? Is there any role of a hinge knee cap or a hinge knee brace? especially if there is a little bit of deformity and patient is not willing for surgery, does it actually help or it's just a placebo? In my practice, uh, yeah, Ronan, go on, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I mean, 
No, basically, Neeraj, I mean, if you want to use some of the actual effective unloader braces, they are extremely bulky and very difficult to wear and remove. Because they, they need to be spanning a significant length of the limb. They need to be sturdy to, enough to take the load of the body that you're putting on it. And they are expensive. But unfortunately, most patients in our climate are unable to wear them for any significant length of time. And if you're going to spend, you know, 30, 35,000 rupees on a proper brace and not be able to use it, I think it's really a waste of time. Yeah, no, I, would, I, would, I, I would agree with that, yeah. Long term, we have not had uh, any patient who has been complained over long term. Uh, so I use it in two situations. One is uh, when I want to know whether my osteotomy is going to work on that patient or not. Uh, I'm a little doubtful, uh, not a classical case. Then I would put them on a deloaded brace, uh, you know, make them three, four weeks. And if they find uh, relief, especially on walking, I know I've got a good candidate for an osteotomy for me. Now, now osteotomy is so predictable. You know, the osteotomy failed because they all developed valgus arthrosis. So that's the, how osteotomies all failed. But now because we don't swing them into valgus, we, we believe it's a, it's a very, very, very long-term solution. Yeah, so we, we, we take our time. Uh, and pick up the right candidates. If necessary, we do double-level osteotomies. So, so even if it means you know we're spending twenty thousand uh, on a brace for a temporary, it doesn't matter. You know, because we're talking about long-term results of the, with the osteotomy now. So we do it in that situation. The second situation is um, patients will say they you know they can't have uh, T care, for example, uh, in uh, in this year because they have to travel abroad, the children are abroad, things like that. And especially if we have their pain on standing. I know, and they don't have pain at rest. I know that they will respond to a brace. So till they, you know, they become in for a surgery, they, I give the brace for them. So these are, but no patient as a definitive management long term. I have found a brace to be useful. Michael. What is the choice of brace? What is the choice of brace when you want to give like that? Unloader braces is really costly, and all of them cannot afford it. Yeah, if you're not using unloader brace, only a placebo effect. Yeah, but no harm in a placebo effect. effect. But no yeah, harm yeah. in a placebo effect, but a true okay. unloader brace. Uh, not only must you unload the brace, you must have somebody adjusting that unloader every time. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So, uh, bracing therapy is very uh, intensive therapy. They come and see the physio every two weeks, and they adjust the brace, and only then it works properly. Yeah. So, the permanent uh, respite, uh, you no know, one can advise that. Okay. Thank you very much. I think there are no more questions, Grace. Just unmute yourself, please. Yeah. So, sir, there are no more questions. Yeah. So, can you just end the session, summarize it? Uh, so, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ronan Roy and Dr. VC Bose. Uh, although we took uh, a little of extra time, but then uh, the session was very uh, uh, insightful. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bose, for that very practical and uh, decisive uh, uh, session based on your vast experience. I think it was very useful for uh, the young orthopedic surgeons uh, who are watching us. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ronan Roy, for that uh, uh, session on the nutraceuticals. Uh, so we thank you. We thank you for uh, uh, you know accepting our invitation and uh, being here. I think it was a, a very a, a great session. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Grace. Thanks bye very bye. much. Thanks, Neeraj, for coordinating. Always a pleasure.